Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending February 13th, 2016. And as I was talking about in the past TDD report about the rumors are that they have discovered gravity waves. Well, I got the article sent by First Navy Thomas 8, my friend Tom, Lynn L. posted, and Rex C. posted in the Dumpster, Dumpster Divers Facebook page about gravity waves have been discovered. I'm going to give you the links to all three links that they sent me, but I'm going to basically just talk about the NPR link because you can also listen to a story. There's a place you can click on the top of the article, but uh, now researchers say they have detected rumblings from the cataclysmic collision as ripples in the very fabric of space-time itself. I guess just about the time they got the detector started up and shortly thereafter they actually detected two black holes colliding uh, against each other. So I talked to you before about how they used it with an L-shaped uh, tunnel with uh, the lasers converging at one end and then they changed the phase so that it would be dark unless the lasers were uh, changed by any kind of gravity waves or anything like that and then they would be able to detect the light. Well, evidently they uh, they did have it happen and uh, went over the data enough to uh, let them know that it did happen. And so, hold on a second, gotta let my cat out. Cat out. Okay, I'll read just from a little bit of the article here. According to a paper published by the Journal of Physics Reviews Letters, the two black holes were each roughly 30 times the mass of the sun. They merged some 1.3 billion light years from Earth. The waves were generated in the final moments before the black holes merged. The signal was brief but definitive. These measurements are dramatic proof that gravitational waves exist. The signal in the detector matches well with that predicted by Einstein's original theory, according to Tchaikovsky, who was briefed on the results. It matched predictions of the ripples produced by two large black holes in the final, mom final moments before they merged, swirling together at enormous speed. So there's a reason for the theoretical part, and there's a reason for the practical part. Now, a lot of people may be saying, now, big deal. Now that we've detected gravitational waves, what good is it going to do us? Well, let's look back to, like, uh, maybe 1880 or so, uh, when a guy named Heinrich Hertz discovered radio waves. He was working on the theories of a guy named James Clark Maxwell that predicted these things. He was the theoretical part of it, but he just thought they may exist, and then the practical part was somebody that actually did the experiments to determine, is there really such a thing as radio waves? And Heinrich Hertz was the one that discovered the radio waves. Well, at the time, people were probably saying, what practical use do we have with radio waves? There's no real use for that. Well, you know, just about everything we enjoy as far as from the internet to satellites to television, radio communication, depends on radio waves. So just because we don't necessarily have a whole bunch of uses for gravity waves right now, at least we know we're detecting things out in outer space. Remember, we have what we can see in outer space based on light waves. We also have radio waves that can penetrate through dust clouds and see even farther away and things that are happening well with gravitational waves. We can see different types of things happening, too, that we can't possibly pick up with other ways. So just as a fact of observing our universe and what's happening, these uh, this laser type of interferometer can act as a kind of like an outer space telescope by detecting gravity waves and give us information for that. And who knows where you'll go. It might be for our great-grandchildren's days that gravitational waves are just as common and used a thing as radio waves are now. You just, you just never know. That's why you actually spend the money, and it was hard to get Congress to spend the money on this, but that's why you try to get Congress and governments to spend money on research science that doesn't necessarily have an outcome that we're aware of right away. But, you know, if we discover something new, chances are there's going to be a purpose for it in the future. And next up... Oak Ridge scientists produce first plutonium-238 in 28 years. That's very important because plutonium-238 is very specific to the space program. It's the kind of radioactive substance that can produce enough energy to act kind of like a battery. It's kind of like a heat generator, and then they use a set of thermocouples in a special type of generator to produce electricity for deep space missions. You can only get so much out of photovoltaic panels, and especially the farther you get away from the sun. And if you want to work, uh, even on Mars, if you want to work during the nighttime too, you're going to have to have some source of heat or some source of energy. So, yeah, we've decided to actually start producing it ourselves after buying it from the Russians because our supply is getting quite a bit down. But um, this stuff is kind of neat because it's also fairly safe as long as it's in an enclosed proper type of container. Um, the kind of radiation it emits can't even penetrate the outer layer of a person's skin. So it's about the safest kind of stuff you can handle if handled properly as long as you don't breathe it in or ingest it as far as swallowing it or anything like that. 
it's about the safest kind of stuff to be used for this kind of a practical purpose in outer space. So glad to see that we're actually getting back into producing it. We produced a 50 kilogram sample of PU-238 and hopefully we'll start producing more. Uh, we have some left that's not in really good shape. I think we got like 35 kilograms of it left of which 17 of the 35 is still useful and they think if we can produce some more high grade PU-238 for the space program they can uh, actually take some of the lesser quality stuff and uh, combine it and get more out of what we have there. But um, they're also talking about, too, if you read this article to the end, they're talking about a sterling alternative. So instead of using um, thermocouples to generate electricity using the heat, using the sterling alternative, which I don't know if you guys know about sterling engines, they, bas they basically work on isolating the cold side from the hot side and using that to produce the work. They say they can get four times the energy from the uh, PU-238 uh, substance. Right now, they're not making it a high priority, though, because when they announced the original budget for the Sterling alternative, I guess by the time they uh, finalized it, the uh, price went up by over $100 million, so Congress was not kind of real anxious to spend that kind of money, but I guess NASA hasn't completely given up on it, and they're still going to do some work towards it, so we might be able to uh, get four times the use of what PU-238 we have left and, and make it last a little bit longer. I will also post the links to the Advanced Sterling Radio Isotope Generator from Wikipedia so you can read a little bit about that and they've got a cutaway diagram of it and then um, you can also read about the Plutonium-238 in the um, Wikipedia article too that I'm going to post. And last up this is new, this is from TechCrunch.com, new Air Force satellite launches to improve GPS. Wow, the GPS system has been around for quite a long time. GPS satellites are operated by the Air Force and provide global positioning, navigation, and timing services both for the military and civilian users. We can all access GPS from our phones because of this very constellation. And uh, Colonel Steve Whitney, the director of the Global Positioning System Directorate, said that the last leg of launches had one of the biggest, most aggressive launch schedules in the last 20 years, seven Block 2F satellites launched in just over 21 months and they're actually getting set up they're gonna launch a block three what they're doing is they're slowly upgrading to get more accuracy too right now I think the accuracy is around one meter but once all these satellites are up and running we're gonna get accuracy to 42 centimeters and then if you know anything about GPS you can actually buy GPS systems I think even for civilians now that are within plus or minus several inches or even closer to that but what they do they use in addition to the GPS satellites they also use ground uh, telemetry like uh, cell towers and navigation beacons and stuff like that and by coordinating all the data they can get the accuracy down but they're talking about getting the accuracy down more and more just by launching more satellites and the GPS three satellites are scheduled to start launching in 2018 but they got a nice little uh, Boeing is actually the one that's providing a lot of these and uh, they've got a lot of facts about what's going on with that um, Boeing and that uh, the reliability of the satellites averages about 24 years now They've been in the running, and there's a total total satellite time for the GPS system in operation has been the equivalent of 540 years, counting the years times the amount of satellites that are still working. And what they do is they put the new satellites up in position. Any old satellites, they move off out of the way and, and so that it's not in the same position. So, yeah, they uh, move, move the old ones out, move the um, new ones in, and I suppose they could also use the old ones kind of for backup or something like that. So, anyway... That's about it for this week. Thank you, everybody, that contributed to this. I really appreciate it very much. It's only because of you guys that I can do stuff like this. And uh, I would like to leave with a little video and a little shout-out to uh, some of my major fans there, the Buckeye Boys, that uh, I know very well they enjoy the, the uh, TDD report. And uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just let the video speak for itself as I, as I close off. So catch you guys next week. Tweet about it's just basically somebody actually put out some rumors. Uh, who was it that actually put the rumor out? This was Lawrence M. Krauss. My earlier rumor about LIGO has been confirmed by independent sources. That's what he says, but nobody's actually saying it. So uh, it could be somebody on the inside of the experiments leaked something out that will.